so Weston really is kind of the the exemplary case that we've seen in which perpetrators of trafficking or target persons with disabilities specifically for their social security income become their representative payee and then steal all their benefits. But Weston is by no means the only case in which victims are abused and targeted for their government benefits. So there's another case in Ohio, U.S. v. Callahan, and it was a young adult woman who had suffered a traumatic brain injury resulting in a cognitive disability. And she had a very she had a young daughter, and she, the defendants were uh, Jordy Callahan and Jessica Hunt, and they befriended this woman and they said, "Why don't you come stay and live with us?" And she said, "Great!" And so she be basically became the roommate. And it was you know, and in many of these cases, you see that where the abuse doesn't happen imme immediately. Um, usually, things are okay for a little bit. But over time, after a while, they eventually moved, forced the victim to move into the basement with her daughter and forced her, began to force her to uh, clean the house. And they had a menagerie of exotic pets and pit bulls, and they made her clean up after them. And they took her social security benefits card. And in fact, I was at a, a panel recently listening to the prosecutor on that case, Chelsea Rice, an amazing AUSA over in Cleveland. And you know, she said that they began to essentially refer to her as their bank. And they took control of her SSI card and made, you know, would use it to buy groceries and cigarettes. That case, they eventually um, were indicted and prosecuted and sentenced to prison, and, and there was no restitution in that case. But the victim was eventually rescued. And so that's one, one type of abuse of benefits. There's another civil case, Frankenfield v. Strong in which the defendant was a conservator of the two victims. So that had a state-level prosecution, Tennessee v. Strong, and then the new conservator of the two victims brought a civil case at the federal level um, suing the trafficker for damages. And in that case, how it arose is it was Lisa Frankenfield and Guy, I'm, I'm blanking on his last name, but Lisa and Guy, and they both had uh, intellectual developmental disabilities and they were married. And they were originally, their conservator was Lisa's sister. She passed away, Walter Strong became their new conservator. And then, so he very quickly began to exploit them. He would use their benefits to buy things like a grill, um, like a TV, and he forced Guy, the male victim, to perform manual labor on his small farm, and in, he forced Lisa to perform sexual acts so that in order for him to give her the money to pay for rent, they lived in a separate apartment, and so he would only give them the money for the rent if she would perform sexual acts on him. That was eventually discovered when the court uh, ordered an audit of the finances, and they saw that something was off. Um, so that's another type of situation in which traffickers are abusing victims with disabilities, first for their benefits, and then on top of it, exploiting them you know, through trafficking. At the heart of every trafficking case is money and greed. And when you unitize a human being and you view a person as a commodity, that is an element of dehumanization. So there's already a level of dehumanization going on in any trafficking case. When you are doing it to a person with a disability who might not be reacting in a, nor in a normal way. I put that in quotes because there is no normal. And who is already otherized in the minds of the perpetrator just by virtue of how they act and they talk and they interact with you. That then further dehumanizes that victim and allows, again, these just extreme levels of physical abuse and violence.